So today is the third sermon in a six-part series on the story of Moses as found in the book of Exodus. Uh, we've been studying this in Sunday school as well, and I want to continue to extend an invitation. You can come join us during the, the time between the two services as we watch videos and discuss the material. You're welcome to come join us for the next four weeks. In the first two sermons, just to kept, catch you up, the first one we talked about the dramatic birth of Moses, talked about how it was in a time of great oppression under the king, King Ramsey, the pharaoh, and how Moses' mother put him in a basket to save his life and floated him down the Nile, where one of Pharaoh's daughters rescued him and raised him as her own. So that was the first sermon, that story, and all the women who, uh, who were very brave to rescue Moses and to save his life. Um, the next Sunday, we talked about the life of Moses after he left Egypt, after he had to uh, flee, because he killed an Egyptian who was uh, torturing and beating a Hebrew slave, and he couldn't stand that injustice. So he killed the man and buried his body, and he had to flee to Midian. And so last week, we talked about his life as a shepherd, uh, and how he got married and had children and had a very tranquil domestic life. And then one day, as he was out as a shepherd, he saw that burning bush, right, the God spoke to him from the burning bush and called him to go back to Egypt to help to free his own people from the Pharaoh. And so that's where we are now. Uh, we're at the point where we see this confrontation between Moses and Pharaoh. And I wanted to tell you the word Exodus, the name of this book, Exodus, is really important. It comes from two phrases or two words, Otis and X. Otis means the way or the path. X means out. And so exodus means the way out or the path out, the path to freedom. And so that's where the name of the book comes from. This is uh, the quintessential story of, of the way out to freedom uh, through the Lord and by God's grace. Now, in order to get ready for this sermon today, I need to warm you guys up a little bit because you're going to participate in the sermon. And there's a call and response and there's a place for you guys to get. Uh, but I need you to warm up your voices a little bit. So what will happen is it, whenever I say the phrase, let my people go, I want this section and this section to say, let my people go. And then whenever I say the phrase, make more bricks, and you can go ahead and put up the next slide, the phrase, make more bricks, I want you guys right here in front of me to say, make more bricks. So we're going to practice. All right. Let my people go. Let my people go. It's pretty good. Pretty good. Make more bricks. Make more bricks. Oh, good, Ron. I could hear you. Okay, now this time pretend you're out uh, watching K-State football, and they're playing the KU Jayhawks, and KU's winning, and you're che you're cheering defense. You're getting riled up. You know, with with everything you've got, right? You 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 with me? All right. Let's do it again. Let my people go. Let my people go. Ha <laughs> ha. Make more bricks. Make more bricks. All right, that's good. Definitely an improvement. All right, you'll know when the time comes. Uh, why don't we, we'll take a moment now, just kind of calm ourselves, have a little opening prayer. <clears throat> Almighty God, we eagerly await your word for us today. May our minds be open to learn and our hearts willing to change and our hands ready to serve. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So Moses did as Yahweh commanded him, and he left Midian with his wife and his sons on a donkey and returned to Egypt to confront the Pharaoh. Along the way, the Lord sent Moses' his brother Aaron to meet up with him and join him in this mission. As Moses and his family entered the city of Ramses, they looked all around them, and they saw enormous statues of King Ramsey II, temples, impressive structures and buildings, very intimidating, uh, displaying the power and the ego of the Pharaoh. This was King Ramsey the Great, as he called himself. Now, Ramsey ruled Egypt during a time of great prosperity, a, a time of great expansion. In fact, he built more structures than any other Pharaoh using this, the, uh, the labor of the Hebrew slaves. King Ramsey enjoyed a cult-like devotion among his people and he had a powerful army at his command. Ramsey the Great was not someone you would want to confront and make angry. And that's exactly what Moses was told to do by the Lord. So for me, it's hard to try to imagine Moses' perspective on this. The, and, and the deep faith he must have had in the Lord to go confront King Ramsey, 
when you can see this overwhelming display of power and ego and brutality from the Pharaoh. King, King Ramsey had enslaved the Israelites to build these great cities for himself. He had oppressed the people with inhumane working conditions, and he even killed their newborns to keep their populations down. King Ramsey brought God's judgment and justice onto himself through his arrogance and his cruelty. And so when Moses and Aaron went to the Pharaoh, they said this, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, let my people go. Let my people go. Yeah, that's pretty good. Moses and Aaron explained that the Lord wanted the people to go out into the wilderness for three days to celebrate a festival, to worship the Lord who had revealed himself to them. King Ramsey scoffed. He said, who is this Yahweh that I should heed him and let Israel go? I, do, I don't know Yahweh. I will not let them go. If they have time for a three-day festival in the wilderness, then they have too much free time on their hands. So tell them to stop being lazy and make more bricks. Make more bricks. All right. So thus began this epic showdown. And there was really only one central question that needed to be answered. Who was really in control? The first thing that Yahweh did was turn the Nile River into blood in order to mock Hopi, the Egyptian god of the Nile. Yahweh demanded, let my people go. Let my people go. Defiantly, the Pharaoh responded, make more bricks. Make more bricks. Good. Next, Yahweh made all the frogs evacuate the river and fill the streets in order to mock Heket, the Egyptian god who looked like a frog. Yahweh once again demanded, let my people go. Let my people go. Defiantly, the Pharaoh responded, make more bricks. Make more bricks. Next, Yahweh sent swarms of gnats and lice and flies spreading disease and killing livestock in order to mock Hathor, the Egyptian god that looked like a cow. Yahweh once again demanded, let my people go. Let my people go. Defiantly, the Pharaoh responded, make more bricks. Make more bricks. Good. Next, Yahweh caused the Egyptians to develop boils on their skin. Yahweh sent fire and hail to damage their crops. Then came the swarms of locusts. And finally, darkness covered the land, demonstrating Yahweh's dominance over Ra, the sun god, the Egyptian god of the sun. And this is, in, this is a phrase in scripture, and I just love it, so I want you to hear these words. It says, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, Yahweh demanded freedom for his people. One last time, Yahweh made his will known. Let my people go. Let my people go. And the Pharaoh's heart hardened. Blinded by hubris, he stubbornly repeated his order. Make more bricks. You did great. And so, God's wrath and judgment came upon the Pharaoh and all of Egypt. God sent the destroyer, the angel of death, to kill the firstborn. Meanwhile, God told the Israelites to get prepared for their journey out into the wilderness. He told them to uh, eat only unleavened bread because they didn't even have time for the wait for the yeast to rise. And he told them that every household should slaughter a lamb and take the blood of the lamb and mark their doorpost and then to eat the lamb for nourishment. When the angel of death came, it passed over any home marked with the blood of the lamb. There is power in the blood of the lamb. There is power in the blood of the lamb. The blood of the lamb protected the people from evil and death, and the blood of the lamb sealed a covenant between God and the people. The people promised that they would be faithful to God, that they would love and serve the Lord only. And the Lord promised to protect his people and to care for his people and to bless them. And after this terrifying display of power, the Pharaoh relented and he released the Israelites. 
The story of Exodus is the central salvation narrative of the Jewish people and is part of our story. Exodus reminds us how God acts in our lives to liberate us from whatever is oppressing us. And just like the pharaohs of old, the powers of the world today will tell you that your value only comes from what you produce and how you perform. The powers of this world will tell you you need to work harder and to do more so that you can prove your worth, so you can earn the love of others. In other words, make more bricks. Make more bricks. Oh, it's got to be, got to be better. Make more bricks. Make more bricks. But there is another power at work in the world. A higher power, right? A superior power. The power of God's grace that proclaims with authority, let my people go. Let my people go. So if you're feeling weighed down by mistakes in your past, if you're feeling burdened by life's challenges, if you're feeling trapped by forces outside your control, God is the way out. God is on your side. The power of God's grace can free you to experience abundant life. And here's the good news, God's grace is a gift. Grace is not something you have to earn or deserve by your effort. The power of God's grace is made available to you when you place your trust in the living God who defeated the powers of this world once and for all on the cross. Amen. <laughs>